Mr. President, members of the Senate, before you this afternoon, as you know, is the Senate resolution to approve the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment to the United States Constitution. And I know that this is a, an issue that has sometimes um, resulted in passionate feelings on both sides of the issue. Um, but I hope that uh, as, uh, as you sit here today, um, you might uh, keep your mind open and, uh, and hear a, a perhaps a different perspective on this amendment than you have heard previously. Uh, and as an initial matter, I, I think it's important to note some historical context for the Equal Rights Amendment. I think oftentimes uh, people think that the Equal Rights Amendment came out of the 1970s, uh, and we've been discussing it ever since then. But in one form or another, the ERA has actually been around for the last hundred years, the last century. It was actually first conceived by Alice Paul and other leaders of the women's suffrage movement in the early 20th century. And in fact, the ERA was first introduced to the United States Congress by the nephew of Susan B. Anthony in the early 1920s. He was a congressman from Kansas at the time. And the language that is before you for consideration today is modeled almost verbatim after the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. And I think it's important to hear the language of both the 19th Amendment and the Equal Rights Amendment together so that you can compare how similar they are. They are. The 19th Amendment, again, which gave women the right to vote, says this, quote, the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex, end quote. The Equal Rights Amendment, which is just 24 words, is very similar, and it says this, quote, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex, end quote. So that historical pedigree there is important for the body to consider, both the 19th Amendment and the Equal Rights Amendment come out of the women's suffrage movement of the early 20th century. And as we know, the ERA has continued to be debated and discussed over the last hundred years. The second point that is important to note is that the goal of the Equal Rights Amendment, that is equality between men and women, has been the law of the land for many years. And of course, a lot of progress has been made over the last several decades. Prohibitions on sex discrimination are already in federal and state law and in about half the state's constitutions, including Virginia's constitution, which has had our own Equal Rights Amendment since the early 1970s. So the question, of course, why do we need this amendment and why now? And the answer is very simple. Equality between men and women is a core fundamental American value. And it's one that we all agree on, no matter where you stand on the Equal Rights Amendment. But despite these protections that already exist, federal and state law and state con constitutions can and do change and as we see every session, every General Assembly, they are changed pretty easily. And perhaps more importantly than that, depending on who you ask, some do not feel that equality between men and women is currently protected in the United States Constitution. In fact, it was Justice Scalia who famously noted in 2010, less than a decade ago, that, in fact, the U.S. Constitution does not prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex. This is what Justice Scalia said nine years ago. Quote, certainly the Constitution does not require discrimination on the basis of sex. The only issue is whether it prohibits it. It doesn't. 
end quote. That's why it's important that we include the, the protection of this fundamental American value in the United States Constitution, just like the other American values that are preserved and protected there. Now, there are, of course, those who oppose the ERA, and we'll hear some of those arguments today. But again, as I noted earlier, Wherever you stand, we all agree on that fundamental American value in the ERA, that the government should treat men and women equally under the law. There's no question about that. But there are nonetheless two primary arguments against the ERA. The first argument is a procedural one. It's that the ERA is not timely and can no longer be ratified. And I'd offer a few points in response to that. First and foremost, this debate is not happening in a vacuum. Other states have ratified the Equal Rights Amendment in the last several years, and as far as I'm aware, neither the courts nor Congress have said that those states were wrong for ratifying the Equal Rights Amendment when they did. Secondly, very smart and reasonable people disagree over whether Congress has the constitutional authority in the first place to put a time limit on the ratification of an amendment, or whether a deadline for ratification can be extended after ratification. And then lastly, let's say just for a moment, for the sake of argument, that the time for ratification has in fact expired and the Equal Rights Amendment can no longer be ratified, and that this is just a purely symbolic vote. Well then at the very least, we should do that. The General Assembly is no stranger to symbolic votes. The second argument against the Equal Rights Amendment is more of a substantive one. And that argument against the ERA is that it could be misinterpreted or misapplied for things other than treating men and women equally. But again, some historical perspective is important. That's why I mentioned earlier, women's equality is and has been protected in large part in state and federal law and in state constitutions. And yet, despite having been the law of the land for several decades, the concern raised in the modern opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment have not materialized in any real way. But more importantly than that, that history over the last 40 or 50 years, I'd ask you to consider it from this perspective as legislators. I'd ask you to put yourselves in the shoes of those same legislators who considered and ratified the Bill of Rights 200 years ago. In their time, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of the right to keep and bear arms, the freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures, were all novel and extraordinarily expansive rights for their time. And there were, of course, those who opposed those amendments in one way or another because of how those amendments might be interpreted or applied, just as the ERA is today. But they were and are fundamental American values worthy of protection from government interference. And they are now spelled out and protected in the Constitution. The same should apply here. The only difference is that the equal treatment of men and women is not a novel or a new right. So the decision here should be much easier to make. I'd also ask you to consider this, reflecting on your time in the General Assembly. How often have you seen the freedom of speech under assault? How often have you seen efforts to restrict religious freedom? How many times have you seen attempts to infringe the right to keep and bear arms? Whatever your answer is to those questions, remember that those are rights that are explicitly protected in the Constitution itself. How fragile, then, is the equality between men and women? 
which is not explicitly pr protected in our founding document. And as you go through that process of putting yourselves in the shoes of those who ratified the Bill of Rights 200 years ago, ask yourself, what if opponents had told you that while those freedoms might be good and just and true, that they could be misinterpreted or misapplied or abused? Ask yourself, would you still vote for them? Whether they be free speech or religious freedom or guns. I know that every single one of you still would. And the same should apply for the Equal Rights Amendment. And respectfully, therein lies the fundamental flaw with the arguments against the Equal Rights Amendment. At their core, the arguments against the ERA recognize that the principle that men and women should be treated equally under the law is good and just and true. But the argument goes, we must reject that fundamental American principle because it could be misinterpreted or misapplied or abused. Put another way, the rejection of a fundamental American value in the Equal Rights Amendment is considered acceptable because doing so would achieve a desired end. I'd respectfully submit to you that that is an ends justifies the means justification. That's an ethic that says that as long as the ends are good, the means to achieve them are also good. But that is not the ethic that any of us seek to live by. It is not the ethic that we raise our children to practice. And it is not the way in which we should judge the Equal Rights Amendment. And in closing, that's why we don't do this in any other context. We all agree that the equal treatment of men and women under the law is a fundamental American value. I ask you to consider what other fundamental American value do we reject because of our concern over how some may interpret it? I can't think of one. The bottom line is that when we stick to our core American principles, which includes treating people equally, regardless of their immutable characteristics, we get it right every single time. And therefore, I'd ask you to support the passage of this resolution. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank the Senator. Uh, Senator from Petersburg. Senator